an SOS letter, not in a bottle, but in a package of Halloween decorations, traveled 5,000 miles from a Chinese labor camp to the USA, drawing international attention. Sir, if you occasionally buy this product, please kindly resend this letter to the World Human Rights Organization. Thousands of people here who are under the persecution of the Chinese Communist Party's government will thank and remember you forever. I was shocked at first um, that they were able to sneak this letter out. In labor camp, they forced us to work overtime to produce military cloth and export goods. China's booming economy continues to increase through the use of slave labor. If I have choices, I really don't think I want to buy those products because it could be made with blood, blood and uh, tears. Shoppers in the Western world. Very few of us think about where the goods we buy come from. Most of them are made in the Far East under tough conditions, and many come from China. In October 2012, when an American woman, Julie Keith in Oregon, opened a Halloween decoration box for her daughter's birthday party, she didn't realize what she was going to see would come to be known around the world. A handwritten letter from an inmate at a Chinese labor camp fell onto her lap. It was a plea for help. Sir, if you occasionally buy this product, please kindly resend this letter to the World Human Rights Organization. Thousands of people here who are under the persecution of the Chinese Communist Party's government will thank and remember you forever. I was shocked at first um, that they were able to sneak this letter out. I know that, you know, they can suffer death if they get caught. People who work here have to work 15 hours a day without Saturday or Sunday breaks or any holidays. Otherwise, they will suffer torture, beatings and rude remarks. Nearly no payment, 10 yuan per month. I immediately went on to the internet and Googled the name of the labor camp and you know, what seemed to be what they were saying in the, in the letter was true. Yeah, I was saddened. I, I had some knowledge of the way things were in China, um, but to really have it brought to my attention like that, it, it made me sad that people are treated that way. People who work here suffer punishment one to three years on average, but without court sentence. Julie posted the letter on her Facebook page and contacted human rights organizations and the press. I just want people to know and you know, remain aware that this is a continuing problem in China and that these people really do need help. According to the letter, the box was made in China at the Masanjia labor camp, where many of the imprisoned forced laborers are members of Falun Gong, a banned Chinese spiritual group. There, they often suffer more punishment than others. Li Yang, a Falun Gong practitioner in the UK, imprisoned in the Masanjia labor camp in 2001, says the claims made in the letter are genuine. Around 1,000 inmates were imprisoned there. They were all Falun Gong practitioners. I did not see any other criminals and they were forced to twist artificial flowers by hand, very thin tree branches, and little plastic snowmen as well. During shipping due day, they have to work until 12 p.m., sometimes until 2 a.m. They were not allowed to sleep if the quota was not finished. Some senior practitioners were too exhausted to get to their bed. In 2008, Li Yong obtained asylum in the UK. Now, every day, she goes to the Chinese Embassy in London as part of a 24-7 vigil held by Falun Gong practitioners in London to draw attention to those held in Chinese labor camps.
Falun Gong is a Qigong discipline combining slow-moving exercises and meditation with a moral philosophy centered on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. It was first introduced in China in 1992. Although the practice initially enjoyed considerable support from Chinese officials, by the mid to late 1990s, the Chinese Communist Party increasingly viewed Falun Gong as a potential threat due to its size and spiritual teachings. On 20th July 1999, the Communist Party leadership initiated a nationwide crackdown and launched a propaganda campaign intended to eradicate the practice. Falun Gong is persecuted in China primarily because of the numbers. There were 100 million people practicing in the country and the Chinese regime, some people in the Chinese regime were nervous about that many people doing something outside of their control. But there's also the aspect of what Falun Gong is. It represents the, the essence of traditional Chinese culture. And the Chinese regime has spent the last 60 some odd years trying to stamp out Chinese culture. It's an atheist regime. And so there was an ideological factor as well. The government uh, decided to frame Falun Gong as an enemy. Some of the most obvious ones are that it had become already larger than the Chinese Communist Party in terms of its membership. Uh, those sorts of issues. And I think those are true. And I think from a Marxist perspective, seeing the spread of Falun Gong through the different class levels and occupations, rural, urban, uh, and all the way up to the Chinese Communist Party itself was, was terrifying. This is the way Marxism is supposed to spread, not Falun Gong. So from that, their perspective, that was something terrifying. Ethan Gutman, an investigative journalist and the author of the book, Losing the New China, carried out many years of observation and research on Falun Gong. Now, I don't doubt uh, that the Falun Gong uh, values are quite real, and they're quite attractive. They actually represent a whole side of China which has been completely suppressed for many years. It's a side of China that most Westerners never see. It may say, Falun Gong says, well, we're not political. Well, no, it's not. But the point is, everything in China must be uh, uh, subordinate to the political. In, their, in the Chinese Communist Party's mind. It must be either harmless and innocent and frivolous, or it must be, if it is ev to have any seriousness, then it must be subordinate. <laughs> Human Rights Watch and other foreign observers estimate that since 1999, hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of Falun Gong practitioners have been detained in re-education through labor camps, prisons, and detention facilities. Adherents in detention are subject to forced labor, psychiatric abuse, torture, and other coercive methods of thought reform at the hands of the Chinese authorities, sometimes resulting in death. In some facilities, Falun Gong practitioners were the substantial majority of detainees. I estimate that probably up to half a million Falun Gong are in the Lao Gai system right now. These are enormous numbers, but that's also because the Lao Gai system itself has been underestimated grossly by the West uh, and by Amnesty International and by many other groups that ought to know better. Jennifer Zhang, a Falun Gong practitioner who survived the persecution in China, said Falun Gong practitioners in detention consistently received the longest sentences and worst treatment. On the first day we were there, the police made it very clear that the only purpose for us to be sent there is to get us reformed. Uh, all sorts of methods, physical torture, including electric banton, beaten ups, and sometimes very shocking methods to female Falun Gong practitioners, sexual assaults, and also sleep deprivation. And also we were forced to watch those uh, propaganda materials. And they also forced other criminals to torture us to, in order uh, to reach their quota. And uh, if the criminals do a good job for the police, they can be released ahead of time. And if they don't uh, reform a Falun Gong practitioner, they may also even uh, not allow to sleep. So others, they turn all the other criminals against Falun Gong. Jennifer Zhang was imprisoned for 12 months in a labor camp before she fled to Australia and obtained asylum in 2001. 
In 2005, she published a book, Witnessing History, about her experiences regarding the persecution of Falun Gong in China. China's re-education through labor is a system of punishment that allows for detention without trial. Under the current system, police can send people to labor camps for up to four years for a variety of vaguely defined offenses. China began using the system in 1957. In 1957, when Mao Zedong's class struggle and anti, um, you know, the campaign against the anti-revolutionaries, at that time Mao believed that the, he needs a system without legal trial to put uh, people away. So in 1957, the re-education through labor established. It was not a law. It didn't pass by any legislation body, not passed by the People's Congress. The system was originally used to detain accused counter-revolutionaries or other critics of the communist government, but it was later expanded to punish prostitutes, drug addicts, and other minor criminals. Now the system is also used to imprison people regarded as a threat to the government, such as Falun Gong practitioners, Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang, members of underground churches, and petitioners who had committed no crimes. Detainees in re-education centers will undergo brainwashing study sessions and are required to write daily thought reports. Detainees are often kept there until they change their thinking China also uses state-run mental health hospitals to keep political prisoners. However, in practice, it has led to the creation of a vast network of prison labor camps known as Laogai across the country. Chinese state media said China has 310 labor camps, holding about 310,000 prisoners and employing 100,000 staff. According to estimates from the Laogai Research Foundation, there are 6.8 million people incarcerated in China's 1,100 labor institutions. Masanjia Labor Camp is one of the most notorious labor camps in China for the most violent, forced deprogramming used by the government to suppress dissidents. Stories of torture at Masanjia first came out 13 years ago in overseas media. There's been well over 8,000 reports of torture and abuse of Masanjia labor camp over the last decade, coming mostly from people who have been detained there and suffered the abuse themselves. One case that came out in 2000-2001 was a case of uh, 18 female detainees who were stripped naked and put into a male jail cell where they were gang raped very violently. Um, this caused quite a stir among the China Watcher community, the human rights community. In particular, Masanjia. Uh, so I've interviewed, I think, six, uh, six people, uh, may, uh, all women, I believe, uh, all Falun Gong, who were in Masanja at one point or another. And the descriptions, after this case came out, after this uh, letter dropped out of this woman's uh, graveyard pack, or whatever it was called, kind of a Halloween fan myself, uh, I went back and started listening to those interviews. And they're quite complex. There's a lot of information on Masanja. It, it was notorious. It was the, the crucible, the most difficult uh, place for a Falun Gong. Uh, like many labor camps, the other, the common criminals, rapists, murderers, thieves, drug addicts, uh, were at the top of the pyramid. They were given control of the labor camp in a sense. Underneath the guards, they were given control and they always had high status. At the same time, Falun Gong uh, has a code of nonviolence a code of passive resistance. And this made them very vulnerable to the conditions inside their individual cell blocks. Masanja labor camp, it's very specific set up a, a woman's labor camp 
1999, um, I think it's uh, October 29th, established by the central CCP um, and uh, the Minister of Justice. And uh, they established this uh, special women's labor camp to brainwash and transform Falun Gong practitioners and design the different torture techniques. Uh, and then they use this technique and uh, the transformation and the brainwash method promote to nationwide uh, all the all China different labor camps and uh, uh, prisons. So um, that's why you know this is the most notorious. All the techniques were designed in this labor camp. In April 2013, the Chinese magazine Lens published a story about former inmate Liu Hua, whose diary recounted the torture carried out in Masanjia women's labor camp. Liu Hua, a petitioner who was imprisoned at Masanjia on three separate occasions, said in Masanjia every day they faced long hours of brutal treatment with little sleep and food. The violent oppression pushed some detainees to suicide. <laughs> Our local government paid the labor camp 60,000 to 100,000 Chinese yuan to imprison us. In labor camp, they forced us to work overtime to produce military cloth and export goods, coats for Italy, shirts for South Korea, no tax towards the government, and no payment to us. If anyone could not finish their quota, they would be badly beaten. On the 22nd of June, 2011, a criminal slept on the top of my bunk bed. She could not tolerate any more and cut an artery on her right arm with a small scissors. Liu Hua was imprisoned along with her husband, not for any association with Falun Gong, but for exposing corruption in their local village party. In prison, she witnessed the treatment handed out to Falun Gong practitioners. So in Masanjia, there were over 400 inmates. 80% were practitioners of Falun Gong. The practitioners' workload is much heavier than ours. If Falun Gong practitioners refuse to work, they will be tortured with extreme methods. One Falun Gong practitioner told me the police bundled four toothbrushes together and turned it around inside her private parts to torture her. The head of labor camp told me there are 36 different torture methods in Masanjia. If we don't follow their order, they will apply any of them to us. Liu Hua also said, because there's no legal process in operation, the term of their detention could be shortened by paying money. Sometimes, if order quotas were too large to finish in time, Masanjia would buy inmates from other camps. The head of our squad told me that if we pay between 80,000 to 120,000 yuan, we can be released right away. There is no serial number on our labor camp release form. For such a report to be published in a mainland Chinese magazine is rare. It shocked China, and the story quickly spread around the world before it was censored by the authorities and covered up. Shortly thereafter, the Chinese government ordered to stop all republication and reporting on the issue. After 10 days of a so-called investigation, the authorities in Liaoning, where the labor camp is located, denied the claims made in the Lens report. Liu Hua said that no representatives of the authorities have ever asked her and other victims, but harassed and threatened them not to say anything. Members of this uh, investigation team actually are those people responsible for what happened in Masanjia. The re-education through labor bureau the head of this bureau was former Masanja labor campus uh, head. The same person investigate himself. Um, there won't be any results. So the results they um, published, denied all the accusation is uh, predictable. China 
China's booming economy continues to increase through the use of slave labor. Inmates are used to produce cheap commodities, which although officially prohibited to go for export, are often indistinguishable from factory goods and continue to find their way into the global market. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection website states that most cases of products found to be made with forced labor are from China. Common everyday products, ranging from artificial Christmas trees, Christmas tree lights, bracelets, tools and foodstuffs. According to a 1998 House Committee on International Relations report, companies which reportedly have or have had products made in Chinese labor camps include many major international companies. Nestle was accused of having some of their products made in Chinese labor camps. Jennifer Zhang confirmed they made fluffy rabbits for Nestle when she was detained in a labor camp. And a special order we received, or labor camp received, was uh, 100,000 rabbits, promotional rabbits for Nestle. So if you buy the products, they give, they give you one for free. So this rabbit, uh, you know, each one needs at least 10 hours and more than 30 procedures to make. And the labor camp only received some five US cents. And we received nothing. So the police actually was very proud of the fact that we can produce products for Nestle because it's a so huge international company. Nestle denied the company's business has any links with the labor camps in China, but did admit it had two companies in China producing the rabbits for a marketing campaign. Frederick Koller, an investigative journalist from the Swiss-French language daily newspaper Le Temps, found Beijing Michi Toys Company Limited is one of Nestle's Chinese companies located just 500 meters away from the labor camp where Jennifer Zhang was detained. I went back to, to Daxing um, just to look around the company to check out if there were no uh, labor camp uh, near the, this uh, Mitsi Toys uh, company. And uh, I easily found out that maybe 500 meters far away from uh, Mitsi Toys, there is actually a, a labor camp uh, called uh, Tian Tang He, and that was the labor camp Mrs. Zheng uh, was detained. Uh, I had other testimonies actually uh, of people saying that uh, they knew that some toys company, because there are many toys company uh, there as well, used to work with labor camps. The Michi company denied it had subcontracted the production to a labor camp. Nestle later introduced a new clause against forced labor and for its future contracts in China. Uh, as for the product, um, usually they don't admit they use this uh, uh, labor camp to produce the product export to Western countries. Uh, they deny, openly deny all the acquisitions. But actually, you know, when the Western company tried to uh, produce product in China, they were subcontracted to a Chinese company. And then this Chinese company will subcontract to the forced labor camp. This way, you know, the company in the United States or other countries won't be able to know, you know their products were made in the labor camp or jail. In the US and Canada, it is illegal to import and sell any products manufactured in the labor camp. Scott Flipsey, a specialist in American foreign policy, has been tracking Chinese slave labor products issues for 20 years. He said it is hard for the U.S. to enforce these laws. Because it requires Chinese cooperation, and China doesn't give that cooperation. It doesn't freely admit uh, that products are made with uh, prison labor. And so the, the way forward here is to expose, for journalists and activists to expose the, t the camps that are doing this, to sort of accumulate uh, stories um, from and very specific with specific details about which prisons are the ones that are producing the goods and then to sort of expose these type of things that will do I think a lot of the a lot of good uh, you know to sort of try to stop this practice. Now China is the world's biggest exporter and trader 
Every year, China exports 2,050 trillion US dollars worth of goods all over the world. In 2012, China exported 376 billion US dollars worth of goods to 27 EU countries, exported 352 billion US dollars worth of goods to the US, and 54 billion US dollars worth of goods to the UK. Currently in Europe, it is still not illegal to import prison-made goods. The European Parliament has called for a total ban on Chinese goods produced through forced labor, which members of the European Parliament say are still imported into Europe in sizable quantities. Two and a half years ago, and we asked the Commissioner for Trade to really undermine that uh, those products can be imported in the European Union, because since Laogai research found out what kind of camps produce what kind of products, the US already did forbid the, the import, and the EU did not up to now, and that's really a blame for Europe. It's, it's frustrating because we asked several times, we are going to ask again. It was in March of this, this year, and uh, the commissioner responsible for trade, he should be the one, he could be the one who really comes forward with an improvement, and we hope that he will do it one day. The European Commission says it's too difficult to identify the origin of such goods, and has therefore preferred to opt for dialogue with China rather than an import ban. It's entirely and totally unacceptable from our standpoint, and I'm not trying to make any excuses for the Chinese authorities. They must, you know, shoulder the responsibility of the way they um, are, are involved in this process. But at the same time, uh, we have to be clear uh, that you can, you know, create legislation, but if it's not enforced, perhaps that's not necessarily the best route, although we're open to ideas and we are always in contact with MEPs and members of the European Parliament. Um, but like I say, right now we feel uh, engagement uh, uh, is delivering results in the human rights dialogue across the board, and this is an element uh, that we are always raising with the Chinese at every opportunity. If you are you know, unknowingly taking advantage of those innocent people, you are part of this crime. And number two, because Western companies cannot co compete with those low-cost, cheap labor in the labor camps, maybe hundreds of thousands of them. And the Westerners, they, they, their factory were closed. They lose their job. Tony Caldera's cushion business has been ruined by cheap Chinese imports. Today, his Merseyside factory stands deserted. It's just hard to believe that this used to be full. It was a hive of activity. There was hundreds of people working here. They all had jobs for life. You know, we were the number one cushion maker, probably in Europe. It was all made here. Everything was made in England, and life was great, and we were all happy. All of a sudden, China's come along, and we just can't compete anymore. I've got no choice. I've got to go to China. I've got to try and make it work over there. Otherwise, that's it. It's finished. The products made in labor camps are produced by people who are forced to work and are in unsafe and unhealthy conditions. Because of malnutrition, sleep deprivation and stress, Detainees in labor camps often contract lice, scabies, and other ailments. Sick detainees are still forced to work. Many are not allowed to take showers for long periods of time, allowing all manner of bodily substances to come into contact with the items they manufacture. These products are then shipped all over the world. Sophie Liu, a Falun Gong practitioner and a Chinese labor camp survivor, said she was kidnapped by agents of the Chinese Communist Party four different times. She was forced to endure three horrifying years inside of a Chinese labor camp, producing chopsticks and cotton swabs in very dirty conditions. We worked there for uh, 21 hours a day. The chopsticks just put on the ground. The prisoner worked too long. The the hands uh, got hurt, bleeding, but they had to work. 
The trouble stickers was very dirty. Us that there for uh, 30 days, but we never took a shower. It's July in Beijing. It's very, very hot. They said it's for exporting. There is a word there. It's sanitized, but it's very, very dirty. So I said to them, we can't do that. It, can, it will hurt people. Then they beat me. Sophie Liu was granted asylum and now lives in the U.S. If I have choices, I really don't think I want to buy those products because it could be made with blood, blood and uh, tears by those innocent people in the labor camp. Why can it be so cheap? You really don't know. And they work two days without being paid any money. Julie Keith took the box and letter to the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Homeland Security Investigations. The Homeland Security Office of Public Affairs confirmed that the case is being looked into. In June 2013, the New York Times reported they had found the man who wrote the letter and tucked it into the box of Halloween decorations that was found by Julie Keith. According to the New York Times, the 47-year-old former inmate was detained at the Masangia labor camp for his faith in Falun Gong. He wrote 20 similar letters over two years and hid them inside products he believed were to be shipped to the West. He was released from the labor camp in 2010. The article says the man's account of life in the camp matched those of other inmates who say they produced the same Halloween-themed items. For Julie Keith, the news came with a feeling of relief. Well, it made me very happy to know that, you know, that, that he was safe and alive because I did receive quite a bit of criticism, like how dare I bring this, you know, letter to the public. Now, you know, now these people in this labor camp will all be persecuted and executed, you know. Um, so it made me very happy to know that he, he was out of the camp and alive. Julie Keith now checks the label of everything she buys. Her friends, she said, do the same. I really try to not buy made in China products. I understand that not, you know, not every product made in China is made under these conditions. So it's, but you know, I always think when I see, I don't go to the dollar store anymore because everything there is made in China. And it's, so I really try to be more careful. I hope it helped. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that said they would really try to change their shopping habits, um, really be careful about the items they're purchasing, um, you know, if people can change the way they think, of, you know, about their purchases, then maybe it'll make a difference.